Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah, Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana. Alhamdulillah, by Allah's grace, we're continuing with our journey through Islamic manners. And we know the importance of these topics and we know how they important they are because we've had an introduction regarding the importance of Islamic manners. And we were dealing with one of the most important topics pertaining to Islamic manners and that was manners pertaining to the Qur'an. Manners we should have when we, read, when we read the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the uncreated speech of the master of the universe and all that exists. So we took quite a few points in part one and if anyone has missed that they can go back to the recording and look at that inshallah. And with regards to what we have today inshallah it's part two of manners with the Quran. So starting with Allah's permission, Bismillah, we're going to look at the next mannerism which is that it's important to say the isti'adha when you recite the Qur'an and the isti'adha is to say A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem saying that Oh Allah I seek safety in you I seek refuge in you I seek protection in you from the shaitan who is cursed and far away from your mercy and majesty It's the sunnah to do this because it's mentioned in the Qur'an and it's from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu as per the Qur'an in Surah 16 verse 98 فَإِذَا بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Whenever you recite the Qur'an then seek refuge in Allah from the shaitan who is cursed and far removed from Allah's mercy. And from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would be that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would always do this. It's sunnah, it's not obligatory to do this, however it's something which is highly recommended. Why? Well, logically first and foremost we know that we have an enemy and that enemy is shaitan. Shaitan is not going to leave us, he's always going to try and misguide us, right? To try to find ways to misguide us. If he cannot misguide us with deeds which are sinful and haram, he's going to misguide us in the deeds which are halal. How is that the case? So we're doing now something which is not sinful, we're doing something which is beloved to Allah, which is reciting the Qur'an. It's halal, it's permissible, it's recommended, it's sunnah, right? There's so many rewards in doing the recitation of the Qur'an. But shaitan, he doesn't leave you alone there. He comes to you and he tries to mess about with your intention. He tries to misguide you pertaining to your intention. Oh, look at you, how good your voice is. Look how amazing you are, how many pages of Qur'an you've read. Oh, look, people are listening to you. Increase your recitation, increase the beauty of your recitation. Things like this, the shaitan will always whisper to your soul, or he will try to whisper to you and make you lazy, etc., to not read the Quran. It can also be the case that you are reading the Quran, you have a good intention, but shaitan may come to you to try to misguide you with regards to the meanings that you are understanding in the Quran, right? So the intelligent thing and the wise thing to do is to seek refuge in Allah when reading the Quran, whether that be in the salah which we do anyway, we seek refuge when reading in the Salah, but also outside of the Salah, we seek refuge in Allah, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, because we want Allah's protection to enable us to tap into the meanings and the beauty of the Qur'an without the interference of the Shaitan. So it's very important that we do that. So we know that we say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. Another way of doing this in the Sunnah, which is reported, by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is to say A'udhu Billahi Sami Al-Alim Minash Shaitanir Rajim Min Hamzihi Wa Nafkhihi Wa Nafathihi This is another way that we can seek refuge in Allah and it's reported in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say A'udhu Billahi Sami Al-Alim I seek refuge with Allah the All-Hearing the All-Knowing Minash Shaitanir Rajim from the cursed Shaitan Min Hamzihi Wa Nafkhihi Wa Nafathihi from his pride, his poetry and his madness Okay, so it's a very comprehensive seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the misbehaving, if that's the correct word, from the misbehaviors of the shaitan. Taib, a question to yourselves. Why is it good to change between a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim and the form that I just mentioned to you and other ways of doing so? Why is it good to change between these ways of seeking refuge? And uh, not only for this act of worship, but in other acts of worship, we have more than one way of doing something. Why is it good to do or to know at least that there are more than one way of, of doing something? Question to yourselves, why is that good? Barakallah fiqh, fantastic, to keep it fresh, to keep yourself alive and interacting with the act of worship. Because if you do the same thing time and time again, you're going to get bored. 
but when you do something new from time to time it keeps you fresh and it keeps you interacting with the act of worship as though it's a new act of worship for you so you're you're interested in it you're you're attached to it more and like one of the persons said in the comments that it's from the sunnah also in in the sense that you're preserving the sunnah because if we only learn one type of this sunnah right whatever the sunnah be and we only learn one type then the sunnah becomes lost okay it becomes not practice and therefore it becomes lost but the more we learn and the more we practice of the various ways of doing the sunnah not only are we engaging actively in the act of worship but we're also helping to preserve the sunnah so it's something which is very good to do when people read the Quran, a common mistake they make after having read the Quran is that they say Sadaqallahu al-Hadim, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has spoken the truth. Allah the Mighty has spoken the truth. Now, this is something which cannot be found upon the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu The Prophet sallallahu didn't do this, nor did his companions radiallahu anhum do this. The words are true, but the Prophet sallallahu didn't do it. And just because the majority of people today are doing it, it doesn't make it right. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in, in Surah 12, verse 103, And the majority of people, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even if you try to convince them, they will not be true believers. They will not be believers. So the verse is showing us that guidance is not with the majority of people. Just because the majority of people are upon something, it doesn't make it right. So just because the majority of people are saying Sadaqallahu al-Azim, that Allah has spoken the truth, it doesn't make it correct because it's not found in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu And one may say, well, what's the problem? What, what, the words are beautiful, what's wrong with doing this? Well, there is a problem because the Prophet Sallallahu and his companions were very careful not to do an act of worship, not to say a word in Islam if it wasn't said uh, as part of revelation because the Prophet Sallallahu said in the famous hadith, Man amila amila laysa alayhi amruna rad. Whoever does an action which is not upon the way that we have legislated, then it is rejected. And in another version of the hadith, Waman ahdatha fi amrina hada ma laysa minhu fahuwa rad. Whoever brings about a new action, a new way of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this religion, which was not legislated, then it will be rejected. So from these ahadith we know that it's we have to be very careful when it comes to doing an act of worship. In fact, the rule is that acts of worship are tawqifiyya. Tawqifiyya means that the worship cannot be done except with the permission of Allah or the Rasul. So unless you have a text from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or from the Prophet sallallahu wasallam, clear evidence saying that this should be done, we cannot do it. So to say sadaqallahu al-azim, though the meanings are nice, it's not something we should be done, but rather we find a replacement for that which has been legislated for us because Aisha, Ummul Mu'minin, the mother of the believers, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she, quote, she quotes for us in the hadith which is collected by various scholars and authenticated by Shaykh Al-Albani Ta'ala in Sahih Al-Jami'ah where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will often say after having recited the Quran Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta so these are the words that should be said okay if you want to get up and you have finished reciting the quran rather than saying sadaqallahu al-azim and allah knows best طيب. it's very important the next etiquette that when we recite the quran it's very important to recite it clearly and slowly and not in a fast manner unless there is a reason for you to do it in a fast manner why? Because this is something which Allah has commanded in the Quran in Surah 73 verse 4 tartila, And recite the Quran in a slow, clear style, okay? In a slow manner, not very slow, in a naturally slow manner Whereby you can pronounce every single uh, letter of the Quran as it should be, should be pronounced You give every letter its haqq Okay, because this was mentioned by Ibn Abbas anhuma, the cousin of the Prophet وسلم, who the Prophet وسلم, made dua for and then became known as Turjuman al-Quran, the one who interprets the Quran. He has a very high status in Islam, Ibn Abbas anhuma, who said the meaning of this tartila, is to make very clear and distinguish, distinguishable each letter and word. Okay, and Abu Ishaq said clarity is not achieved unless each letter is pronounced in its correct manner. 
Some of them, they used to say to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, like Abu Hamza for example, he said, I said to Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, I'm able to recite the Quran very quickly. In fact, I can do it in three days. I can complete the whole of the Quran in three days. So Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum, this great companion, he said for me to read Surah Al-Baqarah, Al Al which is the opening of the Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening Surah of the Quran, okay, around two and a half juz. Uh, he said for me to recite that in one night is more beloved to me because I can ponder it and reflect upon it and interact with it as opposed to reciting the whole of the Quran in three days. And then he said elsewhere, if it is the case that you find yourself reciting quick, then make sure that it's a, a, not a quickness. It make sure that it's a quickness that doesn't go beyond the fact that you can listen to what you're saying, you can understand what you're saying, and your heart can comprehend what you're saying. Okay? Some people that recite this Quran so fast, Alif Lamim Dalik al Kitabu la Rayba fi Hudanil Muttaqeen, it's like this, and the words are not being pronounced properly, letters are being missed because they're not given time to form in the mouth, and worse than all of that, it's very difficult to understand what you're reciting at that speed. You don't give yourself time to reflect and to ponder upon what you're saying. So the general thing is that it shouldn't be recited fast, it should be recited in a naturally slow manner. Okay, not too fast, not too slow. Allowing yourself to pronounce the letters in the way that sh they should be pronounced. However, there is an exception. At times you may be sitting with your sheikh, your teacher, and your teacher may have like 20 students in front of him that he needs to listen to their memorization. So he may tell you to recite quicker. So in that situation, you can of course recite quicker. And also in Ramadan, in the blessed month of Ramadan, which is the month of the Quran, we want to make as many khatma, as many finishings of the Quran as possible. So in that particular month, it's also recommended to recite quickly so that you can have as many completions of the Quran as you possibly can. So these are some exceptions from reciting in a quick manner. Pertaining to this one that we've just mentioned, another important etiquette is that you beautify your voice as much as possible as long as it's not done in a manner which uh, resembles singing, okay? Which is sadly something which is quite popular today. So one should, it's highly recommended to, recommended to beautify your voice, but not to do it in a manner whereby you resemble singing. For example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in the hadith, narrated by Abi Dawood, collected by Imam Abi Dawood in his collection of hadith, ليس منا من لم يتغن بالقرآن The one who doesn't beautify their chanting of the Quran, their recitation of the Quran, is not from amongst us. Meaning that the Prophet ﷺ highly recommended that when you recite the Quran, you beautify it with your voice. The Quran already in of itself is something which is beautiful. And it deserves that we beautify even more with our voices as much as we possibly can. However, if you're in a situation like myself and you don't have a good voice, your voice sounds like a cat is being stepped on or a cat is screaming, you got that kind of voice, then it's not a problem. You can still get a huge amount of reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because as long as you are following the recitation rules, the rules of the tajweed, ahkam al tajweed to the best of your ability, and you have a good intention, then that is what you are going to be rewarded upon by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah wants to see from you that you have a good intention and that you make a good effort. Just because you cannot have a voice like the voices of the imams, uh, the famous imams, or just maybe like I said, you don't have a good voice um, in the eyes and ears of people. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your voice may sound very beautiful based upon your intention and based upon your effort. And this is uh, encouraged to us also in the hadith in Sahih Muslim. Uh, where the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah la yanduru ila suwirikum wa la amwalikum. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't look to how you look and He doesn't look to your status in wealth. Walakin yanduru ila qulubikum wa amwalikum. But rather Allah looks to the state of your hearts and to the state of your actions. So everybody in Islam has a fair, it's a fair leveled playing field. Okay? Just because the person has a better voice, it doesn't mean that they are automatically going to get more reward than you who doesn't have a good voice like they have. As long as you have good intention and you're trying your best with your action, then you get a good reward. And we mentioned previously in previous lessons, right? The one who reads the Quran and stutters when they recite the Quran because it's difficult upon them, then this person gets two rewards. One reward for the difficulty that they're going through and the second reward for the actual recitation of the Qur'an. 
So, as we said, the Quran, when you recite it, if you're able to do so, you should beautify it within the parameters of the rulings of Tajweed. Why does it have to be within the parameters of the rulings of Tajweed? So it doesn't become like a song-like um, singing, which sadly many people do. They, they go overboard with maqamat, etc. And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he said that to recite the Qur'an in a way which it resembles a song is something which is disallowed, it's disliked, it's an innovation. And this was mentioned by the Shafi scholars, the Maliki scholars, and Ahmad ibn Hanbal, as well as other scholars. طيب. Uh, a related point here is that pertaining to beautifying the voice with the Qur'an, we as listeners of the Qur'an or people who want to pray behind somebody with a beautiful voice, we are allowed to go around the town and the city and to search out an Imam that has a very beautiful voice in Ramadan and pray behind that person. Because the whole point of praying Taraweeh, uh, one of its major points is to, uh, you know, to increase your love of the Qur'an to increase your enjoyment of the Qur'an. So if you can find somebody in your locality that has a good recitation or a bit further, it's allowed to go out and to pray behind them. Apart from that, the sunnah is that you should pray with your local imam in the local masjid. Okay, because the Prophet ﷺ recommended that the people pray in their local masjid. However, in the month of Ramadan, as we said, if you want to go out and find somebody who has a more beautiful voice, then you're allowed to do so. Another point which is from the etiquettes of the Qur'an, when reciting the Qur'an, is that a person should try as much as possible to cry when they listen to the Qur'an or they recite the Qur'an. And this is something which was narrated that Abdullah ibn Shuqair radiallahu anhu, he went to the Prophet sallallahu once who was praying. And he heard from him when he was praying the sound of like when water is being boiled in a container. That's how it's described. And what this meant was that the Prophet ﷺ was crying, but he was containing. He was containing the sound of the crying within himself. And so it was like a sound, like this. It was a type of sound coming from one who is crying, but they're containing the sound of the crying. Okay, and also it was narrated that Abdullah ibn Shaddad, he said, I heard the crying of Umar radiallahu anhu whilst I was in the last rows of one of the prayers. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he was reciting from Surah Al-Yusuf, إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ Verily, I only complain of my grief and sorrow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as we know, the Prophet sallallahu and the Sahaba, when they would recite such verses and other verses of the Qur'an, it would bring them to tears, right? And also, the Prophet sallallahu not only when he would recite, he would also cry from listening to the Qur'an. From other people once he said to Ibn Masood in Radiallahu An Iqra alayya al Quran, read the Quran for me. And this great companion Ibn Masood in Radiallahu An who felt strange and felt shy that Aqra alayk al Quran ya Rasulullah wa alayka unzil that I'm going to read to you the Quran and the Quran has been revealed to you. The Prophet Sallallahu said, Yes, I love to hear it from other than me being recited. So Ibn Umar Radiallahu An who start uh, sorry Ibn Masood in Radiallahu An who started to recite from uh, Surah Ali Imran until the Prophet ﷺ got to a point where he said to him, stop. And, uh, sorry, Surah An-Nisa. And he, the Prophet ﷺ heard enough to the point where he said, Hasbuk, enough for you. And when Abdullah ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Masood radiallahu anhu lifted up his head, he saw that the Prophet ﷺ's beard was wet with tears because the Prophet ﷺ had been crying due to reflecting upon the words of the Quran. So now, somebody may think, it's a bit weird, it's a bit strange that crying is normally associated with something which is negative, right? But that's not the case. It's not a negative type of crying when you're in your prayer or when you're in salah, when you're reading the Quran, when you're making dua. In Islam, when you have acts of worship and you cry, it's not out of negativity. It's not out of a negative sadness. Rather, it's because your soul is being reconnected to the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. It's because your soul is being purified and it's becoming overwhelmed due to the profound meanings that are found in that act of worship, in particular the Quran. So when the person recites the Quran and they hear the words of the Quran, it, those, those words can affect the soul and the heart to return the person to a state of well-being whereby they are moved by the Qur'an. They are moved and they are guided by the Qur'an in the most amazing of ways. You find, for example, people, human beings, somebody may love their football team and when the football team scores a particular goal, they become so overjoyed and they start crying. You see people at concerts, right? You see them on the TV at a time at concerts screaming and crying 
due to the fact that they're so overwhelmed that they're seeing their pop star has come in front of them and they're just so moved by the song that is being sung. But the believer, the more they understand the Arabic language, the more they seek knowledge, the more they worship, the more they purify their souls, the more they are moved by the Quran when they listen to the Quran and when they pray in their salah and when they make dua, etc. So this is the type of crying that comes. It's a crying which is mixed with sadness, but it has a lot of sweetness to it as well. It's something that you wish that once you've experienced that you could experience it even more because it's it has mixed within it as we mentioned joy halawatul iman sweetness of faith and some of the salaf uh, uh, a statement just comes to mind that some of the salaf they will say law ya'lamu abna al maluq ma nahnu fi min as-sa'ada la jaladuna alayha bi suyuf la jaladuna alayhi bi suyuf that had the princes of this world and the kings of this world known what we are experiencing from sweetness of faith and 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 true tranquility and joy and and they said this at a point when they were sitting on the banks of a river and dipping hard pieces of bread into the water to eat that as their meal these were people scholars that were on a long journey seeking knowledge and they sat to reflect and they said these words that had the princes of this world and the kings of this world knew the reality of the sweetness of faith and the enjoyment that we're experiencing they would have withdrawn their swords and tried to take it from us physically but of course it's not a physical thing it's a spiritual thing but they were just expressing how lucky they are lucky they are to experience such uh, beauty when they do the acts of worship so listening to the quran and reading the quran if it brings you to tears that is something which is good and that is something which you should try to do to try to cause your soul to be in a state of being moved by the Quran. However, it should never be a type of crying which is a loud wailing, right? As we said, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was that he would cry, but they would cry in a in a controlled manner. It wouldn't be like you hear at times in the Masajid, sometimes the, the Imam is screaming with a loud screaming. That is not the way of the Prophet ﷺ. Pertaining to the Quran, the recitation of the Quran, uh, do we recite it loudly or do we recite it quietly? Now, both ways of recitation are allowed. You can recite it loudly, you can recite it quietly. The ulama have discussed what is best. They say best is whatever suits you the best. For example, if you're worried that maybe, you know, um, my, my ability to, to control my intention is quite weak, and if I was to recite loudly and people were to hear the goodness of my recitation, that will affect my intention. So in this situation, they recommend for us that we recite quietly. Or it could be that if you recite the Quran, uh, there are people around you that don't want to be disturbed. So in that situation, don't recite loudly. And sadly, some people have this mannerism, right? Their iman is increased for a certain period of time and they want to pray loudly in front of everybody, no matter where they are, whether they're on the tubes, whether they're in the shops, uh, they want to pray in the middle of the streets, they want to recite the Quran very loudly in front of people. This is not the way that it should be. You shouldn't be disturbing people with your act of worship, right? However, if none of these matters exist, that people are not going to be concerned with your loudness of recitation, then many of the ulama, they say it's better for you to recite loudly. Why it's better for you to recite loudly? Because by reciting loudly, you're keeping yourself engaged more with the act of worship. It's more nashat, it's more energetic for you to recite loudly. And this is something which has been, uh, it's mujarrab, it's something which has been trialed and practiced. When you recite loudly, you're more in touch with the act of worship that you are doing and you enjoy the words that you are reading and listening to more. If one does choose to recite silently, it shouldn't be silent to the extent that it's only the recitation of the eyes. The lips have to also move. As Allah said in the Quran, Rattil means that the lips, the mouth has to move, the recitation has to be physical. So you find a lot of people, for example, they sit in the masajid and may Allah reward them, they're reciting, but the recitation is only with their eyes. And this is not something which is correct. The recitation should be with the lips. Okay, the lips have to move, even if sounds, a loud sound is not coming out. The lip and the tongue has to move so that you know within yourself that you have pronounced uh, the words of the Quran. Prophet said, Iqra'u al-Qur'an fa'innahu ya'ti yawm al-qiyamati shafi'an li ashabihi In Sahih Muslim, read the Qur'an. Read. Read is when your tongue moves. Read the Qur'an. For verily it will come on the day of judgment as an intercessor for its companions. It will intercede on your behalf as mentioned in Sahih Muslim. Another etiquette is that when we're reciting the Qur'an and that we get a bit tired, we should refrain 
from the recitation if it's causing us to fall asleep if we're that tired and our head we're, we're nodding off then we shouldn't be reciting the Quran the Prophet said in the hadith narrated by Abu Huraira If one of you stands up in the night prayer And then the Quran becomes heavy upon their tongue And the person is so tired to the extent that they don't know what they're saying Then let them go back to bed So the Prophet is indicating whether it's in the Salah or outside of the Salah If reading the Quran is becoming difficult upon you you're so tired you should go back to bed or you should relax or you should put the quran away why because it could be that you are saying things which are not in the quran your your pronunciation of the words become wrong it could be that you you intended to read chapters or verses pertaining to mercy but because you're so tired you ended up reading chapters or verses pertaining to punishment and it's such matters so also when you recite the Quran, if you have the energy, it's recommended to recite the Quran continuously, not to take breaks when you're reciting the Quran unless there's a need for you or a reason for you to take a break. The Quran, it's a way of honoring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we open the Quran, we give it our full attention. We put the phones away, the phones that we are so dedicated to, the, the gadgets, we put them on silent and we don't look out for the latest WhatsApp message or the, way, the latest um, you know alerts in the social media platforms that we are on rather when we open the quran or we start to recite the quran we recite it continually as much as possible without interruption because we're showing to allah that we value your uncreated speech of allah we value the guidance that you are giving us we value and we enjoy reciting the quran if that's the case then the quran has to be above and beyond everything else you can't be reciting the quran and at the same time you're having a conversation with your friend you can't be reciting the quran and at the same time you're looking at your messages on the phone recite the quran in a place that is quiet where you can dedicate and concentrate dedicate time and concentrate on what you are saying even if it's only for five minutes that five minutes of concentrated recitation is better for you than 15 minutes of interrupted recitation so it's very good and it's from the manners that when you recite the quran that you do it in a continual manner not cutting off the speech that you are reciting unless there is an important reason to do so and sadly we find that often when we're in the salah or when we are reciting the quran then that's when shaitan comes to us with all of the ideas that we were trying to think of before we started reciting the quran we couldn't think of them we couldn't remember them but more than often when we go to the Salah or we go to recite in the Qur'an then you find that the Shaitani comes with his attacks and reminds you of important things and so we should always seek refuge in Allah from that and ask Allah's protection. Tayyib. Another thing which we'll end with inshallah, second to last, is that it's highly recommended that when you recite the Qur'an, it's sunnah, that when you come across verses whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being glorified Okay, his his virtues are being extolled. Okay, then it's glory. It's it's, uh, it's pertinent for you to say Subhanallah. When you come across verses wherein Allah Azza wa Jal is talking about how He forgives His creation and how beautiful His forgiveness is, then it's pertinent for you to seek forgiveness at that point. Say Rabbi Khfili. When you come across verses which are talking about the punishment and how severe the punishment is of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how powerful the fire is and that none can escape it if Allah has put them in the fire, then at those points you seek refuge in Allah from the punishment that is mentioned, etc, etc. Maybe you come across a verse in the Quran which talks about how, how plentiful the provisions of Allah azza wa jal are. Okay, وَرِزْكُكُمْ فِي السَّمَاءِ For example, that your, your provisions are in the heavens, right? And to Allah belong the, the treasures of the heavens and the earth. So these type of verses, they will move you to ask Allah for provisions. So when you come across a verse which moves you, it's good to interact with that verse, whether it's praising Allah, whether it's seeking refuge in His punishment, whether it's asking for Jannah and His forgiveness, whether it's asking for His provisions, etc. Because this is what the Prophet ﷺ often would do when reciting the Quran. And it relates back to previous matters that we've mentioned which is that we should be interacting with the Quran as much as possible and I say time and time again it's imperative for us to learn the Arabic language and if you cannot learn the Arabic language then at least have a tafsir in the English language a book of Quranic explanation 
So for example, you can find the tafsir of Ibn Kathir has been translated as well as the tafsir of Imam Sa'di rahimahullah ta'ala. You can read these tafsir slowly and you can take benefits from the meanings of such verses that you want to read uh, on a regular basis and that will help you to interact with the Quran in a better way. طيب, when one person, when you pass by a verse which contains a prostration, okay, a sajdat tilawa, then it's good and it's sunnah for you to perform the prostration at that point. In the Quran, there's around 15 verses of prostration. It's sunnah, it's not obligatory, you don't have to do it. And it's sunnah for you to learn du'as that you say at this time of prostration. So when you come across the verse which has a prostration, then you make the prostration and you say the following du'as or something similar to it. Allah mahtut anni biha wizran, waktub li biha ajran, waj'al ha li endaka dhukhran. Oh Allah, remove from me a sin due to this prostration, record for me a reward due to this prostration, save it for me in the hereafter. Okay? And you can add, wat taqabbal ha minni kama taqabbalta ha min abdika Dawood and accept it from me as you accepted it from your slave and your prophet Dawood and there's other, um, there's other du'as that you can also say in the, um, in the prostration. Now this is for the one that is reciting the Quran, however it can also apply, it's highly recommended for the one that is listening attentively to somebody reciting the Quran. Okay, not somebody who just happens to be listening. Not like you're walking in the market and you hear someone playing the Quran, then you hear a verse of prostration, you have to prostrate. No, that would be quite chaotic. It's referring to somebody who is actually attentively, yes, attentively listening to the Quran, right? Um, this person should also join in with the prostration of tilawa, the prostration of recitation, if they are able to do so and um, they get the reward for having done that and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. There's many more to mention but we'll stop here inshallah because we've done it over two periods as an introductory class of Islamic manners. This is more than enough information for us inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those that reflect upon what has been said and to try to implement the manners that we are learning in our lives especially with the Quran and with other such important acts of worship. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our souls and to forgive our sins. I mean, anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any mistakes and shortcomings were from myself in shaitan. And if you have any questions pertaining to what has been mentioned, then feel free. Wa jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum.